everyone. I'm Michael Green. Uh, some of you may know me from Flags for Good, which if you don't, it's a flag company that we're based on the principles of only making the flags that we believe in. And then we donate a portion of every sale to a relevant charity or organization that is making positive change in the world for the flag that you bought. And um, over the last three years of running Flags for Good, I've been fortunate enough to have done two TEDx talks. I've been able to lecture in universities around the world. Um, I've built an audience of 15 million people online who have seen me blab about flags. Uh, but most importantly, and the thing we're most proud of, is that we've been able to donate over $170,000 to world-changing organizations. And all of that due to flags. Every time I give a talk about flags, I begin with the same quote from the branding designer Wally Allens. He's one of my favorite designers. He says that people want to belong and they want to display symbols of belonging. Flags are incredible diving boards to spring into every topic imaginable. And in the past, I've used flags and this quote to talk about sports and logos, and toxic nationalism, war, and global unity. But today, I want to use flags as a springboard to talk about personal identity, because I believe that we are living in the midst of one of the greatest shifts of identity that humans may ever face. And I feel uniquely qualified to report on this shift, now having started a flag company, which has given me a front row seat into how people are choosing to display those symbols of belonging. And I think that is the bellwether of what they feel like they belong to. I'm calling this talk the state of identity because I do feel like it's a little bit of a state of the union address to the flag world. And the union, of course, that brings us together is our study and our love of these fascinating symbols of identity. Because as identity shifts, flags will not only follow that shift, but they will empower agents of change. But state of identity is also kind of a play on words because I believe that our idea of our U.S. states is just a traditional way of subdividing us into areas of different identities. And that idea of our geographic states, I believe, is slowly dying. One of the first projects that launched Flags for Good into virality on TikTok was my Better State Flag series, where I started redesigning the poorly designed U.S. state flags because, honestly, I owned a flag company and I could, I guess. Um, I started with the easy ones, where I could just take existing symbols and just follow good design rules, good flag design rules set out uh, by NAVA, mostly. Once I got through those obvious redesigns though, I was faced with a lot of states where I was and I still am stumped on how to redesign their flag. North Carolina is a perfect example of this. It has three distinct bioregions. You got the Appalachians in the west, the Piedmont in the center, and that's where all the people are, and then the Outer Banks. And when I was thinking about how would I redesign a flag for North Carolina and for all the North Carolinians, I immediately started thinking of the life experiences of the people that live there. Someone in the mountains of Asheville, North Carolina, probably has very little life experience in common with someone who lives on the Outer Banks. Their life experience is probably a lot more common with someone in West Virginia than someone on the other side of their own state. The license plate for North Carolina focuses on the Wright brothers flying their first plane on the beaches of Kitty Hawk. And this, of course, looks a little bit odd driving up and down the windy roads of the Appalachians in the same way that the old Smoky Mountain, Tennessee license plate looks really out of place on the flat plains around Memphis. So after a while, and after watching what happened in Utah this past year, I might, I'm of the mind that maybe we can't create a modern symbol that that unifies these disparate groups. At Flags for Good, we've seen a rise in bioregional flags, like the Appalachian flag or the ever popular Cascadia flag, which focuses on regions of similar geography and culture rather than these arbitrary borders that were drawn hundreds of years ago. This is a little bit of an aside, but I think it's a fun one. I've been speaking at Duke University every semester in uh, NAVA member Elijah Lape's class, and I've used uh, North Carolina as an example 
to see the if the bleeding edge AI technology could help out in this fight to get, have a good flag. If a flag is meant to be a representation of the values and symbols and colors and geography of a place, then why couldn't an AI image generation tool uh, just create the perfect flag for North Carolina if you gave it all the relevant information? It has access to the internet and so it could do its own research so and also it sidesteps all of the political infighting and personal biases of the the designer and the people judging it so i figured it's kind of perfect and this is what uh ai came up with the last time that i asked it to design a flag so clearly uh ai has some more learning to do when it comes to flag design but i really can see a future where this could be used to make objective designs if you just feed in all of the colors and meaning and every terabyte of history of North Carolina you can into AI, like maybe it could save states from the heartache that they're going through with flag changes like we're seeing in Utah. But probably not. <laughs> I don't have an answer to this question and I can't predict the future, but all of this kind of highlights my first big point that I want to make, which is that our identities are always birthed out of our lived experience. Furthermore, we have always chosen symbols that most closely fit our lived experience. And in the past though, our lived experiences have been largely homogenous within the civic structures. But I believe that is changing rapidly. The first question I wanna ask is, where do you actually live? Because the life experience of you versus your next door neighbor used to be quite similar. And some of you in this room are probably old enough to remember this, but if you're not, let me kind of describe it. 40 years ago, you and your neighbor probably went to the same grocery store, pumped gas at the same station down the street, you watched the same local weatherman, you probably worked for the same large employer in your town. When, when there was a good show on TV, everyone in your time zone had to tune in to the same channel at the same time to catch that next episode. But not anymore. The idea of where you quote unquote live has shifted massively. Now we get our groceries delivered. We could live in one city but remote work for a company across the country. With streaming, you get to watch the shows you want to watch on your schedule and not just what's on at the time. Hell, we've even foregone objective news and we now choose the news that we like based on what already you know, fits with our preconceived notions about the world. Our lived experiences are highly personalized. And furthermore, moving to a different state to go to college, that's not foreign, that's expected. And moving across the country for a job just to do it again in less than five years is the norm for millennials like me. And the roots that we, play, that we plant in every place are shallow. So the first big change in human identity is that we are now hyper mobile. Whereas 30 years ago, people's lived experiences in Indianapolis, where I now live, was largely homogenous. Now it changes from house to house. And personally, who I pay taxes to and what weather we experience is probably the only thing I have in common with my neighbor. And who wants to fly a flag for taxes and weather? So the first thing that I see happening as it pertains to flags is that city flags and state flags will continue to decline in use because our identity is becoming less and less correlated with them. Now, remember, this is a gradual change over years and averaged against an entire population. This also might seem counter to the sudden surge of flag redesigns and usage in the post-Roman Mars TED Talk world that we now live in. Cities and brave states are rapidly creating new flags that follow good design rules and help foster that civic unity, uh, which is great. And I think we can all agree that's awesome. But and I'll touch on this trend a little bit more later. But this shift away from identifying deeply with your physical locality doesn't mean that we have less sense of personal identity. In fact, I would argue that we would probably have more sense of identity than we ever have before. But a person's physical location is just becoming lower and lower in that identity stack as compared to maybe 50 years ago. And I think this trend is just gonna continue. 
A teenager today is more likely to identify with an online group that they may have never met in person than maybe their city or their state. And they'll root for a team across the world because they follow like an influencer player on Instagram or something and stream the games online maybe more than they would root for their local high school where they may know the players personally. All because where we live our lives, the the quote-unquote where, is increasingly online and virtual. So the second huge shift I see in human identity is that we are hyper-connected. And this isn't a surprise. This hyper-connectivity helps people understand themselves. This is a good thing. And I, I would argue, here's an example. If someone was diagnosed with a rare illness 50 years ago, they may not have ever gotten to meet up with people who have had that same diagnosis. Now, that person can instantly find an online community of people who can support each other, they can crowdsource their experiences, and and now that person can feel understood and not alone in their struggle. And rightly so, we've seen a modern surge of new flags pop up for the disabled community, for those on the autistic spectrum, the deaf community, mental health awareness flags, and more. Participating in digital spaces allows for a lot more control over how you get to present yourself. So people who have traditionally struggled to be a part of society, like neurodivergent people, queer people, people of color, etc., are now finding it much easier to participate in the public discourse. What might feel like new voices speaking up are actually just previously quelched voices finally having the safety and the platform to be heard. Since Flags for Good is a large player in the LGBTQ plus flag space, many people ask me all the time about like all the new pride flags that keep popping up. And to that I say, these ideas of identity have always existed. We are just now finally entering a time where people feel safe enough to explore themselves and to share their experiences publicly, organize themselves, and then express outwardly who they feel that they are. This isn't new. They just feel safe now, finally. Hypermobility and hyperconnectivity are making our identities less rooted in locality, in family, and in the things that we did not choose for ourselves. And in return, we're seeing a rise in where we see our lived experience going, which is flags of chosen community, of fandom, of interest, of preference and expression. Even our nationalities are not immune to this hypermobile, hyperconnected trend. Estonia was one of the first countries to offer e-citizenship. And I'm in the process, I've started this thing, to go get an e-citizenship in Estonia. Because then I could open a European Flags for Good branch as a domestic business within the EU and never step foot there, you know, have a European Union bank account, but I never have to go. This intended purpose of the e-citizenship is just that, for online businesses to make domestic businesses and sort of get around these national borders that happen digitally. But it also highlights the fact that our governments, our city, our state, and our national governments are just service providers. There is nothing stopping us from getting to a point where our nationalities act like streaming services, where citizens can subscribe to a nationality because they like the health care and the tax benefits and the protection and the welfare, etc., that one nation provides over another. And I have proof of this, it's easy to see, because the rich already do this. It's just finally getting down to normal people, and smart countries like Estonia are making changes to meet this trend. Nations are becoming less of a part of our identity structure, and more about what they can provide for the people who are under it. Taking this a tad bit further, maybe too far, uh, but I'm kind of known for that, I am of the belief that flags and anthems and patriotic displays are all tools of a government can use to just distract us from the fact that they are just simply service providers. Patriotism and pageantry and tradition are a way to create societal taboos to make wanting change feel wrong. 
So, of course, it makes sense that the people who are least served by the current power structure are the least patriotic. So it kind of makes sense that the United States is one of those places that has more patriotic displays than possibly any other nation because it also has some of the most inequality in terms of who the government serves. Having a well-designed flag that the populace adopts into how they express themselves is a net benefit for both parties. But the cities and the states that are finally trying to jump on board with this great flag design trend might just be a little bit too late. I recently taught a class about flags and nationalism at Bath University in the UK, and I asked students how they felt about certain flags that they see every single day. And when asked about the St. George's Cross of England, all of the students said it gave tones of England for the English and nationalist factions. A personal example here in the United States is that many on the political left, including myself, felt that the U.S. flag was usurped by the far right during the Trump administration. And even now, to this day, some people hesitate to fly the United States flag because of fear of what people might think when you do. As nationalist factions are on the rise once again around the world and here in the United States, younger generations are associating these flags with toxic nationalism and xenophobia. Now, rest assured, this breakdown of mainstay societal structures isn't happening because of some nefarious, evil, globalistic plot, as some might argue and say, but it's happening because the existing antiquated power structures are not designed to fit in the modern hypermobile and hyperconnected world. Upcoming generations see that the status quo was built to represent and serve some and not all, and they're not okay with that. Identity is shifting as power is shifting. More power is in the hands of individuals than ever before in history. Access to the breadth of human knowledge is in everyone's pocket. People have more power to define and shape their lived experiences. And now more than ever, someone can do their own research, go move across the country, express who they are or who they want to be, and that is just going to continue to increase, which is a good thing. We are in the middle of the largest shift of human identity in human history, I believe. And as we come to better know ourselves, we are all waking up to the fact that certain identities were overtly excluded from society. And a future is coming with full intersectionality and coexistence of cultures. It is the inevitable end of hypermobility and hyperconnectivity. But at the present time, we're in the middle, the messy middle and we're taking swings at the future that we want to create. And sometimes they fall short and sometimes they go too far. But there is a time coming when a Starbucks won't need to fly a rainbow flag to show that queer people are welcome in their space because it will be so normal for queer people to feel safe in all public spaces. One day, Flags for Good will not need to make Black Lives Matter flags because society will value black lives as much as any other. But until we get there, these flags are the way that we create the world that we want to see. When I look at my company and what flags we choose to create, there's a common thread among a lot of the newer things that we see on the rise. At Flags for Good, we think of ourselves as providing tools for people to create spaces where people can feel included where they haven't before. People want to belong, and they want to display symbols of belonging. Wally Allens' quote will continue to be true as we look into the future because it's just human nature. But the number of things that we get to belong to is exploding as we're able to live more hypermobile and hyperconnected lives. And for those of us interested in how people display those symbols of belonging, let's just say it is a great time to be a vexillologist. I mean, here's the thing. I. Yeah, it was basically how can you make sure that you're not jumping upon a future that isn't a reality, maybe, or yeah, it's not a straight line. Yeah, and I think there's a beautiful quote, I think it was MLK, that said, history is not a straight line, but it arcs in the direction of progress, right? And I think, and I, I left this out of the talk, but I think when we're in this middle stage between where we're going and where we're from, 
we're going to be taking swings at, at what we want to do and what we want to see. Some of them will fall short and some of them will go too far. And that's going to happen. But I believe that the path is going to be an exponential one as it follows technology, as it follows everything. And, it, and everything has not been like this. It's been like this, right? So it's going to be crazy to see what we, and even the next five years. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer. We just have to keep our ear to the ground, you know? This is, it could be an entirely separate talk on AI and flags. It's fascinating. One thing that's that's really good for AI is you can it can give you all those options and you could pick the best one and say, hey, give me more like this. And it does help it figure out, okay, this is what you're looking for. And it, and it all depends on the AI model that you're using. The ones you saw, I think, were Dolly 2. Um, Adobe came out with Firefly, which is an interesting one, but it doesn't do like hard vector based things. It's more artistic. So um, I think it's going to be a fascinating world when it comes to um, AI flags and, and all of that here soon. It's true. And last night we were talking about this. We had a few drinks. Uh, it was a great conversation. And as Nava provides, and uh, we were talking about how actually our political ideologies are starting to feel a lot more like fandoms. And it's more about our team winning than it is about actually getting progress. So uh, yeah, it is a scary thing when it when you look at the trends, um, but hopefully we will keep on there. Absolutely, I agree. And that, honestly, it's one of the reasons I come to Nava because you know, as I'm sitting in Indianapolis and uh, doing my flag thing on TikTok, uh, you know, I can feel a certain way, but when I come here and I, I meet people like Jim, who's you know been a part of the flag world for God knows how long, right? Uh, I've learned so much. Right. And I learned these things, that I, you know, I just never knew. So I think it is important for that intersectionality of wisdom and age as well as intersectionality of different ideas and cultures and, and everything. Yeah.